What do you have to add in your heart? Except a few. But the numbers on the side of the enemy are so overwhelming, the Bible describes it as the whole world. Revelation 13 verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose name is not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All that dwell upon the earth, and what do you say in your heart? Except a few. And by God's grace, do you want to be among that few? Amen. Yes. And I have Revelation 12 verse 10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, who accused them before our God day and night. Let's pause on that verse. That verse exposes one of Satan's most effective approaches to discourage and break down people spiritually. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God. How does the verse end? Amen. Day. And what does day and night mean? Always. All day. Genesis 1.15, 1.5, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Day and night, evening and morning, all day. Satan keeps up his accusations against us before God constantly. What does he accuse us of? Sin. That's the only thing, sin. Now follow me closely. For the devil to accuse you of sin, or when Satan accuses us of sin, is he accusing us of sin in the future? No. Sin when? Or the past or the present. But the minute you commit a sin, it is sin past. You didn't get that. Let me give an example. You see this bottle of water? Did I just pick it up? Is that past? Gone. Now I can pick it up again, but I can't repeat the first pick up. Are you with me? Because that is gone. The minute you sin is past. Unless you stay in the sin. But even if you stay in the sin, every second that passes goes into the past. Satan accuses us of sin's past. And he has a point. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, the Bible says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of of God. Now I told you last night, the Bible is a book of opposites. If Satan accuses us, what do you think God does? Now you don't need to answer, I want you to think. Using the rule or the principle of the law of opposites, if Satan's business is to accuse us, to remind us of our sins, to throw our sins into our faces. What do you think God does? He does what? He defends us. He justifies us, says one sister. Let's go to John chapter 8. Our subject is Mission Impossible. John chapter 8, we shall read from verse 1. It's a very familiar passage. It's exactly 7.30. For those of you with us for the first time, we try to finish by 8.15 once we went beyond. We won't make that a habit, so please don't be nervous. John 8, reading from verse 1, but before I read from verse 1 of John 8, if Satan accuses us of the sins we've committed, what's the only way to shut him up? Okay, yes. The only way to shut him up is to stop sinning. But you're one step ahead of yourself. Because even if you and I stop sinning from the 8th of April 2011, what about April 1 and March 6 and July of 2000 and September of 1994? Can we change that? Yes or no? No. What's our subject? Mission impossible. So if you know Satan specializes in bringing your sins back in your face, as many people like to do, including spouses. <laughs> Did 
Did I just tell the truth? Yes. All right. Let, don't go switching off into that, that, that direction now. If we know that's what he does, then the only way to silence him is to remove the basis on which he accuses, and that is sin. Now, by the grace of God, we can stop sinning from today forward. And then he has nothing to say. But he has the past to drag us, which is what he does. He drags us the past, and we cannot change our past. That is mission impossible. But since the law of God requires a sinless life, past, present, and future, that's a perfect law. If the law tolerated sins past, it has ceased to be what? A perfect law. And since the law reflects the character of God, and God is perfect, His law must be perfect, and God requires of us perfection. Then something has to be done for us that we cannot do for ourselves. Are you with me? Amen. What is the mission impossible? What is it we cannot do? We cannot do what? We cannot change the fact that we sinned in the past. Some of you listening to me, you may have been a thief. Whatever. A liar. A tax evader. Trafficking in whatever. Human beings. Drugs. Endangered animals. Now God has touched your heart. And you wish you hadn't done all of that. And I wish I hadn't done all of that. But I cannot do a thing to change it. One of the greatest sources of pain is regret. You wish you had raised your children better. Now your son is in prison. And someone else is somewhere else. And you regret and you cry to God. He hears you. But the regret, the regret just eats you up. Is there a remedy for that? The answer is yes. Amen. Now let's go to John 8. Reading from verse 1. Our subject is mission impossible. And Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Let's look at this woman's condition. They did not hear that she had committed adultery. They saw it. You know, there's a verse that says, For what the law saith, it saith that those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. When God says, I'm a sinner, I shut my mouth. This woman, there was nothing she could say, because they saw her. Her mouth was shut. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, which was true. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that he might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself, and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, verse 9 of John 8, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Finish the verse for me. Hath no man condemned thee? Was she deserving of condemnation, yes or no? Yes, why? She sinned. Sin is the basis for condemnation. And what is the condemnation? You're going to die. Because the wages of sin is not influenza. The wages of sin is death. And I mean the second death for which you don't come back. Remember Lazarus died? Jesus raised him, he died again. That's not the death, that's the punishment for sin. You don't come back from the punishment for sin. So people die every day, that's not the punishment. The punishment is 